All right, well, welcome everybody to uh, our evening session of Family History. Um, thank you all for coming and gathering here today. My name is Imogen Wegman and I am a member of the Family History team here at the University of Tasmania. It's great to have people in the room. Uh, often we have our Family History webinar series that is all online, so it's really nice to see some faces in the room. But of course, welcome to everyone who is online joining us from afar as well. Now, I know you are all dribbling in from all over the country. Uh, and so welcome uh, to you all. Now, today I'm joining you, those of us who are here in this room are joining you from Nipaluna in Hobart. Uh, and we are in Lutruwita, Tasmania. And we are meeting on Aboriginal land, sea, and next to Aboriginal waterways. And I acknowledge with deep respect the traditional owners of this land on which we meet and on which all of us meet around Australia today. Now, we are gathered here today to hear from Melanie Meto. Uh, Melanie has joined us today from Canada. She is here in Australia on a 10-month sabbatical uh, researching uh, the legal files of prosecuted bigamists in Australia. Uh, she sent us an email a few months ago telling us that she was going to be out here and she would love to meet us as family, uh, the family history team. And would we like to hear about her research? And of course, we said, yes, please come and talk to us. And so we are very excited to have her here. Now, she has a research grant from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council called Marrying Too Much, Bigamy in Australia. And so I welcome her here today to talk to us about bigamy prosecutions the Tasmanian way, seven years transportation to 10 minutes in jail. So thank you very much, uh, Melanie. Hi. coming tonight for you here and I think it's on. Is this on? Yes, can you hear in the, the background? Yeah. Yeah. So for being here tonight, I'm much of an extrovert, so I really like to have people here. Uh, and thank you, you online, uh, for being there as well. Um, as uh, Imogen was telling you, I, had, I do have this big research grant to study Australia, big in Australia. You might ask why the Canadian government fund me to come here. It's because you're a nation of bigamists. <laughs> <laughs> There's more than 2,500 uh, prosecuted cases of bigamy in Australia. So compared to my uh, corpus in Canada, this is amazing. You can do some statistics with that. Although I did fail my statistic when I was in college, but I'm much better now. So uh, I have to tell you that this is a project that I'm still doing research on. So what I'm presenting today are preliminary musings. Um, it is things that I came across and I'm still collecting the data. I'm still collecting the case files. Imogen said I was on a 10 month sabbatical. It doesn't exist in Canada. It's either six months or a year. I'm on a six month sabbatical, but I'm a 10 month year. Don't ask me how I do this. It's just amazing. Uh, but it's a six month sabbatical that I'm on to go and collect all those case files, those that have been surviving, as a matter of fact. So I have been so far to Adelaide and to Melbourne. So when I'm going to do comparison, it with those two jurisdictions. So when I'm presenting my Tasmania data, and I'll present some from um, Victoria and uh, South Australia. But before I get to the thick of things, let me show you a short video clip uh, from one of your excellent television series. Uh, it is Rick. So I'm going to do like this, I believe. Like this. Like this. <laughs> Somewhere else here. How? Are you, is it going? Sure. OK. Should be working, we test it. Yeah, indeed. Give me a second. Any of you have watched it before? I mean, it's about 10 years ago. Some of you have. I binged the series, it was just so great. <laughs> All right, 
I'm just going to stop the share and redo it. Expects a model husband. Only twice. The reality is, if Mr. Danner had married his first wife and just decided to have a squalid, shabby affair with Monique, he would not be before us today. Indeed, he could have still had kids with his second great love. He could have bought a house with her. The law would take no umbrage. But because Mr. Danner chose to do the honourable thing, the thing that both women wanted, which was to marry them, Ms. Makepeace now wants to incarcerate him. We have shown Mr. Danner uh, to Your be Honor, a generous sorry father. to interrupt the Sermon on the Mount. Some information has just come to hand that has great relevance to this matter. Three wives. <laughs> when you were charged, this fact might emerge. I was hoping it would. I don't know if there's a law for trigger me. Bugger me. <laughs> Where the judge? Right here. Right here. Who is she? I'm at her in Newcastle. Oh, the new restaurant, yeah? Her name is Juno. She's like a juniper berry. She's got a sharp flavor, but with sweetness also. I don't care if she carries a seed pod on her back. Stop marrying people. I love these women. Yeah, well, now you're going to have to learn to love men in showers. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, want, I, want, I want to ask you all uh, online and here actually um, is that the image you have of what a bigamist is does that correspond to when you see bigamy what you imagine yes. yes so you'll be surprised to know that there's very few of those double lifer that the court prosecutes in Australia I'm not saying there's none no double lifer I'm just saying that they are not being prosecuted if you want to know why, go read my blog. But I will tell you <laughs> uh, right away. Actually, most of those I won't find. The double lifer, we don't find in the uh, criminal case file. We will find them in estates law. Because we discover them only after they die. Or, you know, like all these series, uh, it's when a truck driver has a heart attack and now there's two families coming in. But usually those double lifers are quite intelligent. And they don't get caught only when they die. So it is a misrepresentation to imagine that bigamy is about those double lifers. It's completely different. Most cases, actually, I want to say that they have a quite respect. It's ironic what I'm going to say, but it, that we do respect marriage, monogamous marriage. This is not what it is. They're not having two spouses at the same time. So um, these cases make for interesting stories, but they're not the reality. So, coming back to my title, which was Big Me Prosecution at Tasmania, wait seven years transportation to 10 minutes in jail, I want to argue that while Tasmanian did not hesitate to accusate, accuse people of bigamy, the court rarely imposed a harsh sentence. I am tempted to add that as historian of divorce Henry Finley argued, and it's a quote, there was also a general if erroneous belief in England and in the colonies that if one party were transported, both parties were released from their marriage and free to marry again. So that's something that he said in 2005. And I say it, I'm tempted. Because if family suggests that society did not care about bigamy, I will propose another interpretation as I go along. So posted for that. Oops, can we go back to my slides? Good. So I want to uh, start by telling you about what bigamy is according to Tasmania criminal law. This is the uh, 1924 criminal code. Uh, and what you're supposed to see um, is the fact that bigamy happens when you're already married with one person 
you do not annul divorce, the spouse is not dead, and then you marry another one. So it's an act of deception. It's the fact that you are marrying someone. And this is why Drake was so great about it. Because he's talking, you just didn't have to marry them. Have them as a mistress. Have many kids. It's all right. Just don't marry them. <laughs> and I love them. That's what they want. Anyway, it's just great. Uh, so that's the first way to commit bigamy. The second way to commit bigamy actually is quite interesting too. Is because if you knowingly marry somebody that you know that is married, so you're not married, this man there is not married, but he wants to marry me, and I am married. Did I do something? So you would not be, you would be a bigamist just like me. So that's the second way to marry, uh, to, to commit bigamy. What's interesting in Tasmanian law too is that they're really gender neutral in their terms. Uh, there's only this little thing from him or her, but otherwise they're really good. The jurists, when he came up with it in 1924, were really good in just choosing terms such as a married person or a spouse. In other jurisdiction, uh, they do talk about husband and wife all the time. But that's the law in 1924. And something that is not written here is what is the punishment for bigamy? Actually, it's not written here because it hasn't changed since 1881. And in 1881, uh, code or law, it was said that uh, somebody who is found guilty of bigamy is, could have a sentence as much as seven years. Seven year sentence for marrying twice. That's what could happen to you. So now that we all know what this bigamy is and what the punishment can be, um, let me move to my outline for the talk. So, I'll first talk about my corpus, which means what are my sources. I'll go after that and give you some quantitative data about uh, Tasmania. And then I'll have the qualitative analysis. So I'll talk about more uh, specific cases so we can get a better idea of uh, what's happening here in Tasmania. We'll have an, an idea about the attitudes towards the offense. I'm not sure. Okay, so when I do this, <laughs> so here's the corpus, uh, and uh, I only have 39 case files of the 159 cases uh, that uh, happen in Tasmania. There's only 39 case files which survive, and that you have here what it, the case file looked like. I also uh, went through, you know, your marvelous trove which you all have to go and sign a petition before they do something to it. Uh, but they have about uh, more than 1,300 articles, uh, which deals with um, bigamy case in Tasmania. And also I have the registry data. This is where I can get um, numbers. And this was collected from the prosecution project, which is also, I suspect you also use that in your things. Uh, in your courses. So that was really good to get the numbers of, of bigamists. That's the, the corpus I'm dealing with. Now, I don't want to make anyone jealous here, but some of you who are not in Tasmania and are in the other jurisdiction know that uh, there's only like a, one out of four case files which has survived for uh, Tasmania. But in other jurisdictions, if you look at South Australia and in uh, Victoria, the bigamy case files are marvelous. Uh, we have more than uh, like 78% and about 86% of them have survived. So coming from Canada, that's where I did my research before, where very, very few case files, even worse in Quebec, they destroyed them because they didn't have any room. So if, you, if numbers were not finishing, but with a 07 or 03, then the file was gone. This is heaven, paradise. <laughs> this, I have numbers. So anyways, that's all the case file so far. We'll see what happened with the, I'm going to Perth next week. Now, let me give you a few more uh, data here. Most interesting in my mind, mind about the newspaper coverage is that while most of, um, while Tasmanian cases, no, while in Tasmania, the newspaper would cover cases from other jurisdiction, most of the Tasmania cases were not covered outside. Oh, look at this. People are laughing at this. I guess you're used to that. You don't count in Tasmania. Uh, but what does this graph uh, mean is that uh, for the number of case file I uh, cases I have, not case file, 
There's a few cases where there's no coverage at all, about eight. And actually, that's because after 1955, there's not many articles from Trove, in Trove from Tasmania. So I have nothing, no case file, no coverage in the newspapers. But most of the cases will have between one and nine articles in the newspapers. And here you understand in Tasmania newspaper. And between 10 and 19 articles, there's 22 of those and 22 of over 20 articles, uh, which are devoted to these cases. Here, for instance, when, what do you think, you know, what is it that you're gonna have a Tasmanian case which is covered somewhere else? Anyone has a guess? Zero. Louder? Zero. No, it happens. It happens and it's covered, but when? Only when it involves another state. Yes. So when they either attracted or they have married somewhere else, then they talk about their local little boy or woman and say, hey, they will mention it in their own newspaper. So for instance, I think this is a, oh, wait. Percy Coops, uh, which was a jockey. Did I show it? Am I saying that properly? What do you imagine? Horse rider? Yes, <laughs> but that's an H on that, so horse rider. Uh, he was arrested in 1924 in Tasmania. Well, half of the 69 article, and this is the case which has the most article, 69 articles, half of them came from Tasmania, but there was also uh, 16 from New White South Wales, 10 from uh, Victoria, and uh, five, I think, from uh, Perth or uh, whatever from, uh, no, five from Queensland and only one from South Australia and Western Australia. So most of the article were from Tasmania, but some other state did cover it. And why? Ooh, this is here. Isn't it? Where's my scoop? Yeah. So uh, let me tell you about him a bit. Coops married his first wife, actually his wife, because his second wife would not be a wife. You know, that's why there's only one wife. The second one is not legal. So he married his wife in Melbourne in 1920. 20, but four years later, he married once more at Launceston. Yes. Yeah. That place up north, <laughs> uh, and uh, a local girl, and he pled, he's very bright, that he did not know what he was doing, <laughs> <laughs> because it was a result of a head injury. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, oh, it did go, wow. So this is from the case file, this one has survived. Um, he received a suspended sentence. So the judge did believe him. Witnesses at his trial confirmed that he had fallen from his horse many times. And one of these witnesses was a father, his father-in-law, the father of the second bride. And as you see here, it says, I know he has, has many falls. So that convinced the judge that, yeah, he had a head injury and that's why he married. So he got a suspended sentence. But here, my point is that other newspapers talk about it mostly because it was also in Melbourne. Now, oh yeah, my special effect, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> A few more uh, numbers to give you. What I want you to see from this graph, what do I want you to see from this graph? Let me tell, I mean, I'm a teacher first, by the way. So let me ask you here and online think about it. What do you see, anyone? And I know a few names, so yes, you Yeah, Yeah, you see that? And what does that mean? Is, what color is, is that Victoria? Yeah, this is Victoria. This is a number of cases, these over the years. So Victoria, you see that? And what do you see for South Australia and Tasmania? Somebody started paying attention in Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> okay, somebody, uh, what we see is that it remains pretty, you know, like it's, it's not that many cases when you look at it per the case. Um, but, you know, what those numbers mean if it's not about population growth, you know, and, and it's really hard when you do bigamy because it's not only about population growth, it should be about marriage rates. And that's very hard to identify, especially if they are married in one state and the other. But it gives us anyways. What it shows is that indeed, actually in Victoria, no matter what, how much the population grew, it's incredible. I mean, I haven't seen that in Canada. In Canada, it's tough. After the war, we just go down. We never prosecute again. 
here, and it's stuck in 1947 because I don't have access after that. Who knows what's happened after in 1948? I'm just gonna wait until next year to see that, you know, what is gonna happen? And it, it shows something to me. I, I want you to think, what do you get out of that? What does it mean that we are prosecuting bigamists after the war? And why is it that we're not prosecuting anywhere else? It's not only about the population growth. Um, so yeah, I wanted to show you this and show you here that you know, like both which are you know states with less population, it's normal that they won't be as high, but we don't see an increase. True enough that in a South Australia, I have all the records. We do see it going up again. Do you have a, a guess for that? Look, I'll point again. The war. The war. And what happened when we have a war? Men go away. Sorry, men go away and marry twice, and women stay there and then want to be taken care and marry as well. And also, there's detection during the war. It's easy to identify bigamists because maybe. The woman is marrying many soldiers and there's lots of pension going to this person. Mm -hmm. there's, but it's also the surveillance state. So these are also a question of during the war where we see more, but something interesting to look at. So those are some of the numbers. Now, still going on statistical data, when I proposed the, uh, the title, I was really sure that there was this Tasmanian way of doing things. And I thought, oh my God, look at this. The first prosecuted case was a woman in 1841. They're going after everyone. Uh, so I thought they were going to have the highest rate of prosecuting women, but it was only 30%. 30% uh, is quite locked. I mean, it's nearly one out of three is a woman. But it's not doesn't differ that much from the other states, South Australia or Victoria, which is about 26 and 28 percent. So there's not much of a Tasmanian way about going for women. Famous. However, uh, when we compare sentences, now we have a Tasmanian way. Okay, I will say that my graphic designer followed my instruction which were different when I did the Victoria one. I was more interested at different kind of sentences, but the color schemes work. So just look at the colors. Don't look at everything else. What you're supposed to see in this is in the blue, it's heaven. You don't go into prison. Anything which is not blue, uh, such as um, uh, the orange and the red is either because the orange is it's light sentences, either until the rising of the court, but otherwise, it's lighter sentences, and the darker it is, and you're staying longer in prison. Same point in Tasmania. What do you see? Elise, what do you see? <laughs> I see um, more suspended sentences. Yeah, that is exactly what you're supposed to see. You're supposed to see that more people are acquitted, more people are discharged, and more people receive suspended sentences. So the question is, why are they going after these people? I go back to Finley, and we're saying that there's not much interest in bigamy. But why are you informing on these people? Why are you doing? You know, like sometimes sentences doesn't necessarily mean that they don't care about it. What does it mean? So, see, I have to follow my slide if I don't want to go away. Um, <laughs> so. That's, I came back to this. So, oh, yeah, one thing we could do is to think about who is the informant? Who has to gain in telling about a bigamist? And you know what? The case file would be really good there because you often, in the case file, you have the, that often, 98% of the time, it's only one, you have the informant. So the paper that says complaining about it. Who is complaining? in Tasmania? Who is stealing that paper? Neighbor. Hmm? A neighbor. A neighbor? Oh my God, that's good. No, 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 it's not a neighbor. That would be so lovely. Actually, I don't know who is complaining because most people who are filling the um, sheet are constables. There's only two who are either the first wife or the second husband, but otherwise is a constable. I would know more through the newspapers, perhaps, 
but it, it just it doesn't tell us who go and tell the constable or do you have a morality squad who goes and says, mm -hmm, look at this, look at this, look at this. I have no clue about this. But the neighbor, look at this, would you tell him your neighbor? That's quite interesting, by the way. Um, so my wonderful sister, who actually happened to uh, work on this project for a while, she had nothing else to do, and you know, the kids were all grown up, she said, why not we throw? Uh, she was fascinated uh, with these newspapers article, and uh, she could not understand who was gaining when we send bigness to prison, especially when we send men to prison. Who are going to take care of those two families if they were thing? She was actually, if you think I'm emotional, you haven't met my sister. She was really getting mad at reading these things and reading them set, being sent to prison. So she kept asking, who were the victims of bigamists? Who are they? How do we know? So for female bigamists, usually the victim was a second husband. Any reason why? Greg, any idea? Anyone? Because? Because he's supporting someone else's wife. Actually, I made a mistake. That's what we didn't know. It was the first husband which was the <laughs> <laughs> And then that's your answer. It's a good answer. The first husband was the victim because he was losing his property. Oh, yes. Okay. But for women, uh, usually the victim was a second wife, in quotation. And why? Try again. I'm not making a mistake. It's really the second one. Why? Do you know? Inheritance. Slaughter? Inheritance. Missing out on inheritance. Yes, you have something there. As a matter of fact, it's because she has no legal status. So the second wife is the one that is the victim often in the mind of judges and society. So here that we're talking about gender, let me get to my next slide. Here is another thing which is quite interesting to me about the Tasmania data. What you're supposed to see is that there's not much of a difference between how they treated women and men in Tasmania. Most of them got in the blue, didn't go to prison. There's not that many uh, people who went to prison, although obviously men did have a uh, higher sentence. This is going to make much more sense when I compare it with Victoria. So you have this in mind now? Now check Victoria. No, I did something wrong. I have no idea. <laughs> okay. Victoria. Oh. What do you notice? Big difference. Big difference, exactly. Look at how many people, uh, how many men got suspended compared to women. So Victorian judge were reluctant to send women to prison. But not you know, they, they really wanted, uh, they went more on, uh, on a suspended way. So let me turn to other interesting data. Here I'm laughing. I think that you, you should be all worried about what I'm about to do. Because we, should, we agree, we should agree that offenses depend, you know, how the sentences are going to depend on who commit the offense and who are the victim. It shouldn't uh, depend on the judge. Would you say judge are impartial, aren't they? I mean, they're great. But as I was going through and looking that there were so many, that's something also special. There's many cases which are judged by the same, or are, are, are heard by the same judges. So, I don't have all of them. I just took the one that had a three or more. I know you're going to see there's only two because I forgot to put the acquitted. There's a, sometimes there's an acquitted as well there. I just put there uh, those judges and what they did, either, they, either if they uh, gave a suspended sentence or if they sent people to prison. So again, my trusted friend, some people don't want to look at me now because I might ask, <laughs> what do you see there? What do you think is surprising when we look at this? How, what? how individual the sentencing patterns are. Can you see it, How 
individual, how specific to each individual judge, the different sentencing patterns. Yes, we're not supposed to see all green or all red. That doesn't make sense. You can, I mean, to me, this is quite, it's big volumes. It makes more and more sense to have just this script in 1914, 1939, and he has a half and half, than to think that somebody either only gives suspended or send them to prison. You have to, uh, to see that uh, the judges have been put also in uh, chronological order, okay? So here, starting with uh, 1841, uh, Montague, I don't know how to pronounce that. Montague, I was going to say that. Montague, ha ha ha, uh, send uh, both uh, two in prison, one he acquitted. Uh, Justice Smith sent to prison. So are we tempted to think that at the beginning they were sent to prison and later on, not so much? And yet, you know, here we still have Chris who decide to send people to prison. Um, so what I want to say about this now is is there a Tasman way? Is there a judge way? Uh, you notice that Judge Justice Morris, I'll talk more about in, in, him in a minute, but look at him. After, when he gets on, which is 1940, he only has suspended sentences. So we'll do a bit more on him in a moment. But I cannot pass this opportunity. Anyone have heard about this? You know, this is it. When you tell people about the kind of research you do, people write to you. So <laughs> two weeks ago, there's one man who was charged of bigamy in Perth. I'm going there next week. <laughs> yes, it's still happening. And actually, this was so interesting to me. Uh, and, I'll, uh, and I'll bring you to my next topic. So I'll, I'll quote from here. Um, I was quite surprised by the Australian Federal Police, the AFP, the leading senior constable, Kevin Lermans, uh, and he stated that allegation of deception and bigamy were going to be treated seriously. So here's this quote. This type of deception and offending has long lasting and negative real life impacts on the victim and family involved. And the FEP will ensure allegations like this are investigated fully. The man was even refused bail. Oh. <laughs> this, this is scholar. A law scholar in, in Western uh, Australia in Perth, at Perth who is arguing that we should cancel, uh, repeal bigamy law. I cannot wait to hear what he has to say about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I'm talking about here, you know, like the, I want you to get into what people thought about it. We were saying, you know, is bigamy just, you know, something to joke about? No. It was a serious allegation. Let's see. Not that serious for Judge Morris, who sent them all suspended sentence, by the way. But. So let me get back to history. In fact, to the first prosecuted bigamy case in Tasmania, which happened in 1841. The genealogical record confirmed that in September 1839, 19-year-old Sarah Nick Dalton married 29-year-old Shoemaker William Nichols, according to the rites of the Anglican Church. With bride and groom, each signed with an S, the official document. Only two months earlier, Nichols had asked permission to marry his fiance, and he received authorization a fortnight later. On October 14, 191840, the Anglican Reverend James Norman united 22-year-old Sarah Nichols Spenters to the bachelor Thomas Sowell. And the bride put her ex beside the name Marianne. Although just above, she was identified as Sarah. I think it's quite important that I say that. Taking into account the sentence she received, seven year transportation. I don't know, where do you transport somebody from Tasmania to? Somewhere, you must know, you know where we transport them? I, I don't know, I'm asking really, I, I'm ignorant of where we send them, probably to New South Wales. 
at some point. So uh, when we consider that seven years, plus the judge admonition, which the Hobart Courier uh, printed, Judge Montagu hoped that the publicity which would be given to this sentence would have the effect of putting a stop to such a bad practice. It was the first case ever prosecuted, but it was bad practice. So we may be tempted to believe, because of what Montague said and the seven-year sentence, that Sarah intentionally deceived Seoul by attempting to pass as a spinster and lying about her age. But the glaring mistake on the register suggests she may have been clueless. She did not know how to read nor write, she used a married name, Nichols, rather than reverting to her maiden name, Dalton. That suggests that she was not trying to mislead her future partner. Uh, maybe this was just a foolish rather than a malicious deception. Not sure. I don't want to go into details about the coverage, but I'm going to simply state that one can hardly count on the accuracy of newspapers to reconstruct the events given the different accounts. For instance, the Colonial Times said the first husband appear, appeared quite concerned about the situation and has employed the best legal assistant to extricate her from her difficulties. But that contradicts the accused own statement saying, my first husband prosecuted me. Thomas Sowell was the name of my second husband. I was married to him five months and two years to my first husband. And that was from the court records. So what I'm trying to say that, that there might be lots of coverage and there might be a lot of people who say the same thing and they may all be wrong. It's always difficult to know which one is right. It took four years for John, uh, Judge Montague to encounter his next set of forgiveness and uh, the jury acquitted Thomas Edwards because the parish priest could not say for sure that he was a man that he had married. Because usually in bigamy cases, to prove bigamy, you need not only to have uh, the celebrant testify about uh, the, um, the, the, the bigamist, but you also have to have the witnesses who, attend, who were there to testify. I'm saying that and put this in the back of your mind because I'm gonna ask you a question later. I know there's no test, but I'm gonna ask you a question. I'm a prop, you know? So, um, but uh, so since he couldn't say, you know, couldn't recognize him, uh, the guy was acquitted. But Montague sentenced 40, 42 year old James Molden to seven years transportation. And the judge took again uh, advantage of his platform to mention how bad bigamy he was, and especially for a man. If the man married, it was his duty to protect and cherish his, cherish his wife. In the present instance, the prisoner had knowingly and willfully acted wrong. He had, likewise, availed himself of a false name. And then the journalist added, the case was a very bad one. And his honor had heard so much of the increase of this offense of late, and particularly among persons of the same class as a prisoner, that he considered it his duty to visit the offense with the severest punishment which the law permitted. He hoped, therefore, the sentence he was about to inflict would act as a warning to others. Probably did, because if you go back to the uh, graph with uh, how many cases were prosecuted, you will notice that actually it dropped it. Um, next, I have this. In 1950, I'm jumping, but uh, to show again the judges, Obar Chief Justice, John Morris, the one who only gives uh, suspended sentences, told um, Burroughs, uh, he gave Burroughs only the suspended sentence, and he did say actually that uh, the crime was not a light one. So he does, there's a, there's a discourse about how bad the crime is, but then he just give a slap on the wrist most of the time. Um, here actually, I was gonna say, you no, know, that was with time, uh, we could think that in, in 1950 for Morris, it was you know, just a question, okay, it's not that important, but actually another judge, uh, Judge, which one does this say there? Gibson. Gibson, thank you, which actually is not on my graph because he only had two. 
Uh, but he decided to give a nine month sentence to this man in, in 1951, uh, a man who was too callous for leniency, leniency, says the judge. So this is not only a question of time, that's what I'm trying to get at. It's not because, you know, in 1950, Justice Moran, uh, Morris is not sentencing people to prison. This judge finds it's uh, important enough to send somebody to uh, prison. Um, what? I'm getting. Oh, but Jeff Gibson, which if you go into the newspaper, you'll find that he has a tendency actually to send people to prison. Not only bigamists, uh, but if you look, this is what your newspapers are reporting. They're calculating how many um, months and years uh, this judge gave to prisoners. So they were for eight years and three months of sentence, which is uh, given by Judge Gibson. Uh, again, you know, different newspaper, and for seven men also, the just uh, sentences, he was, they were sent to jail. I wanted to tell you a few things about Judge Morris uh, to get into his own mind. So what we have, let me just check. In 1941, Charles Storen married and offered Jean Cooper. And according to his statement, they quarrel all the time. She left him and he asked for a divorce. In 1943, he married in New Norfolk, Evelyn Pulford. And then in 1944, at the time of the trial, the couple had one child. Since the second wife wanted to marry Doran, Judge Morris gave him a suspended sentence. This is the kind of logic my sister likes. <laughs> Why punish a man who is now living according to the norms of society, taking care of his family? What good would there be to send this man to prison? A few months later, Judge Morris encountered James Regional Wright. The 28-year-old man had married at Albert Registry, Margaret Rayner, in 1938. They had three children during their marriage. According to him, they did not get along and he agreed to part. When she testified, Margaret did not mention any quarrels. In fact, she pointed out that uh, he supported her and the children until two months prior to the trial. John, John, John stopped, Jane stopped payment shortly after he married Frida. Not sure if the judge said so when he sentenced him, that's Judge Morris, but the papers reported that Wright had served for two years in the Middle East. This is a war. Is it because he was a soldier that Morris decided to He too received a suspended sentence. Perhaps Judge Morris also told him that he had to support his legal wife, but that we won't know. One last example about uh, John Morris. In 1946, Charles Orlando Graham appeared in front of him. It's a bit of a sordid story. He did not get along with his first wife. And to make sure we, to not lose the second lady he met, because he really fell in love, he said, I'm, he's going to marry her. That was a way to not you know, make sure that he has uh, got a grasp on her. When it was found out, he had abandoned the first wife. But when it was found out that he had married again, the second wife was not really happy. And actually, she didn't want him anymore. So he tried to commit suicide. The Judge Morris um, said, His Honor said, he re uh, this is reported in the paper, His Honor said he regarded it as one of the more serious type of bigamy. It's a different type of it. <laughs> And it was the end of the matter, he would have no hesitation in saying it was not a case for a bond suspension of sent a bond or a suspension of sentence. I don't know, he hasn't come any cross, uh, cases which were not for that. He only gave suspended sentence. So it was very surprising for Morris. He was, however, that's the judge, influenced by the certificate from the medical man that a jail sentence would be prejudicial to Graham's health. We will mark the court's disapproval of the crime by a sentence of five years imprisonment suspended. <laughs> to show, you know, let's be suspended for 10 years. Just show that it is really bad, bigamy. 
Uh, but uh, also there was this medical thing that uh, the guy was epileptic. So my question about Judge Morris, why she simply showing mercy to these bigamists? Is it the, 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 the time? Is it the, the, the kind of man he was? Is it that bigamy was not so important anymore? Uh, when I look at the uh, ABD, the Australian Dictionary of Biography, he did see that Morris uh, had a keen social conscience, uh, that he had, had liberal outlook and values. Maybe he was like my sister. <laughs> I mean, my sister would like him a lot. <laughs> so what I wanted to say now is that by the end of the period of the study, what we see in the newspaper is that people did not expect that bigamists would be jailed. For these two women uh, who were, uh, cases were in 1947, it took many by surprise. The, uh, the articles are quite factual, but what you notice here is that they're not that, uh, what's the word, uh, imaginative in their title, the way they go about it, but it's two different newspaper, very neutral text, but the bold title that Bigamists are being jailed, they're not expecting that. So it's a surprise. And those are two women who actually uh, were jailed for six months each. One of them had uh, three kids, left her husband. Uh, she had married in 1928 and married again only in 1946. And the judge decided that she deserved to go to uh, prison. And the other one, uh, I don't remember exactly, her name was Law. And she also, she didn't have kids, but uh, she did say to her husband, future husband or fake husband that uh, she was divorced and she was no terrible thing. They went to prison, these two women. So the so social discourse at that time feels like, you know, people didn't expect them to go. I mean, Morris has been on the bench for so long and he's not sending anyone to prison. So that was a bit surprising. Now, oh, I'm, this is it. Let me conclude. Yes, I am there concluding. And I have to look at my what I want to see about my conclusion it is this, this, this. I want to stress that very few bigamists in Tasmania receive jail sentence. Is it because judges felt that the prison term would not benefit any of the victims? What do we make of the gap between the harsh words of the judges and this tendency to, say, to give suspended sentences. So I think this is something special uh, to Tasmania. But now, because you know, I'm self, uh, what's the word? I want to get something out of you and out of you too. I was not looking at this. Oh, the two. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Uh, I want to get to my next slide. Is that here? Is that coming? Yes. Actually, I have a favor to ask you all especially if there's lots of you online, if you do genealogical studies uh, here, is that I have discovered, uh, I was telling you about that to prove bigamy, you need to have the priest or the minister to come and uh, see that they celebrated. And this guy, Paul Freeman, is at least coming twice, uh, 10 times in my database. So I'm wondering, who is he? <laughs> How many people did he marry? And I'm telling you this because in Victoria, I have discovered some very interesting cases of other people who kept coming into bigamy trial. I have discovered a matrimonial agency, which was founded in 1887, and they were marrying a bulk of people. Happens that with 50,000 marriage, some of them were gonna be bigamists. Not only did I find them, but I also found Reverend Kinsman, who married more than, no, not more, about 10,000 couples in his lifetime. You know what it means? It means that sometimes he married, you know, uh, once a day, or sometimes he married five in a day for so many years. So now, do you have a kinsman here in Tasmania? That's what I want to know. So if you're doing family history and you have come across your ancestor and they have been married by uh, Paul Freeman, I would be really interested in knowing. Please do contact me. I'll tell you after. 
You have one? Yeah. Yes, see? That's why. Yes, tell me. Email me after or we talk about it. Finally, let me thank uh, the history program for accepting my invitation to come here, and especially Imogen and Kate. Also, uh, the staff at the Tasmania Archive, and especially Scott, because they, uh, the archive, uh, the system was down in one day, and I made him go twice to get uh, the documents, so I feel really bad about it. So in case he, he looks, okay, Scott. Uh, and then I want to thank Frederick Heinrich, who uh, prepared the graphs. It's not her fault that the data was not the same. It's mine. And uh, Shirk for supporting my research. Thank you for being here. All right. Uh, so questions from the audience. So or if, comments. Or comments from the audience. Uh, so Greg is going to keep an eye on any that are in the chat box, in the Q&A box on the webinar and shout them out. And I will repeat them for the group here. Uh, and if you've got any here, then I will repeat them for the people online so that everybody knows what the question is. So let's start with one from the internet, if we've got one. Fantastic talk. Um, what about current bigamists? What about current bigamists? So I'm very surprised about that one in Perth because there's not that many bigamists these days. So that's just a bonus that it's happening. I mean, I shouldn't be too, too excited about it, by the way. Uh, but I will give a more sober answer. Actually, the crime of bigamy these days is completely different. Uh, you should have understood from my presentation that the crime was one of deception. Uh, you're either deceiving the second spouse who doesn't know about the fact that you're married, or you're deceiving the state. That's when both spouses know that one of them have been married. Today, there is bigamy, people who marry more than once, but it's more of an immigration uh, crime. Uh, it's one to receive, uh, if you want to think about the state's green card, or here, whatever card you get to, get to, to, uh, to work. Uh, this being said, when I started the research back in the about 20 years ago, uh, there was two sites, uh, which was stuffbigamy.com and stuffbigamy.us or something like that. And uh, I chose bigamy because I thought it was a crime which was not as bad as rape. It was easier to read those files. I wanted to get to know about marriage. But when I read about those stories uh, in stuffbigamy.com, the victims, uh, they were victims of serial bigamists, people, and, big, and they were men, mostly men. A few women uh, commit that kind of bigamy. And uh, they were uh, fraud. They were emptying their account and also beating. And then they were like, no, that's a very serious offense. Not sure about the birth man, which I don't even know his name. No, I didn't look. I was just happy babies. Uh, but I mean, uh, what I read quickly in that newspaper article was that he married. Uh, then he didn't divorce, he married a second one, uh, he left her and he married a third one. But there's no, by the time he married the third one, there was a divorce, so he shouldn't be charged for that one, just for the second one. But I don't know. So that's my answer about it. It's a different crime these days. What about the status of the children? So the question was, what about the status of the children? And it is a wonderful question. Uh, here in Australia, you have laws that look after the children. Uh, I'm not sure about the inheritance law. It's themselves uh, what happens. But in, for the time they're living, uh, they have to be taken care of. You know, you have the deserted wives law uh, back then. Um, really early, it comes in. Do uh, you know exactly the date? I don't know the date uh, like this. So you look more after the women. You know, there's a way to go after uh, the men who are abandoning their family. Uh, I have a case which is quite interesting in Canada that was uh, trialed a few years ago, and it is uh, Els Angel. So, uh, Motorbike gang. Doing drugs. Okay. And actually he was killed in action. No. He was a murder. And this guy had, a, he was in Vancouver. He had a wife and two children in Vancouver, but he also had a mistress and two children. 
and they discover him only with, at the estate. And the mistress uh, argued that he had told her that she would inherit. Uh, and then it, it, it really comes to the quirk of my research because I'm interested about what are the roles of marriage. We're talking about inheritance, that's something indeed. So, you know, with common law, does it matter if we're married or not? So do you want to know what the judge decided in that case? And it, obviously the married woman had no clue that her gangster husband doing drug stuff, she wouldn't inherit from that drug money. She didn't understand. But the judge decided to separate the estate for the two family, to, to, to take care of the second family. And to me, it's mind boggling because it means that marriage doesn't mean a thing. For the person who is married and think they're protected, if they marry for the inheritance or for whatever to be protected, it means nothing in Canada. Ah, actually in DC. It does still mean something in Quebec. That's the only way you can get something is if you marry them. But yeah, does that answer? Yes and no. I'm not so much concerned about inheritance as social status of children. And I'm talking in the 19th century rather than the 20th century. So uh, they are the status is that they're still bastard, if you want, but they are supposed to be taken care of. That's what I was trying to get at. Does that answer better? Yes. Yes, um, Imogen, there's a, um, a couple of questions around the difference between bigamy and polygamy <laughs> um, and what the difference is. So what's the difference between bigamy and polygamy? Thank you. I love that question. Uh, in Canada, it's one of the only jurisdictions where it's just a clear cut between the two. Uh, you don't have these laws here in Australia, nor I have seen them in other jurisdictions. In, but it does go into an explanation as uh, what you can, even though you don't have the law, this is what it shows, okay? So in Canada, there's two sections in the criminal code. There's one against bigamy, which I told you is a crime of deception. It's the fact that you are marrying someone. Ray was telling you, you can have 13 mistresses or lovers. It doesn't matter. You can have families with them and whatever common law. You can have three common laws, only one marriage. Don't go and marry twice or thrice, trick, trick on me or whatever he says. <laughs> Polygamy in the Canadian uh, criminal code is really clearly explained. It is to live conjugally with more than one person. And our criminal code in Canada came in 1892. It was just after the Mormons came in Canada, which uh, were expulsed, if you want, from uh, Utah. And, uh, and they came and settled in Canada. So that was a way to make sure that the polygamist sex of Mormons, because polygamy had been outlawed by the Mormons, but uh, would not be able to practice, practice uh, polygamy. So now the difference is really this, even in other jurisdiction, bigamy is only when you marry. That's everywhere, it's the act of marrying. Polygamy, you can live with many people at once. And usually it's not polyandry, it's really polygamy, it's men with many women. And what was the second question? And it was a, you said there was two with that or it's the same? I know that there's other questions, but. Okay. Yes. So all the cases that you've been looking at, are they all local rather than say convicts that have come mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. and have remarried in Van Diemen's land when they've already, you know, have a wife that they've left um, back in England or Ireland or? Yes, this is what is really interesting. There's not uh, many cases of convict, you know, like uh, now we have Sarah Nichols who's marrying a convict because he had to ask permission, but she's the bigamist. Uh, there's a really good article by um, Rebecca Probert. I can send it to you after you send me a link and I will send it to you. And she looks, because I'm only looking at the prosecuted cases of bigamy, only at those that went in front of the court. Even if they were dismissed, they still went. It's hard to get to the other bigamists, you know? I always say there must be one in the room, but there's only seven, maybe in the 80, there's one of you who are there. Um, 
But for her, what she did, she used a family genealogist, family historian, and she asked them to send their story, those that they, they have found when they were doing their own research. And she discovered, actually, uh, that for many of those uh, who were bigamists, because they had two wives, uh, actually, they were not according to a real bigamist because either the distance was, they were not caught because of the distance, and also because there were seven years between the marriages. And it seems that in England, seven years is enough to get off bigamy. It's not in Australia and it's not in Canada. You need to prove that you knew that the person was not alive. If you happen to be living in Hobart and then you have also in Richmond, the spouse is there, they won't believe that you didn't know that this spouse was not, uh, was dead, uh, was not alive. So they will still send you in a suspended sentence, no, they will send you to prison. So, but there is an uh, exception to the law about the seven year absence. So what she finds is that those who have escaped prosecution, they put that uh, distance between the marriages and they put that those signs between. Uh, interesting question uh, related to marriage, actually. Um, the person asking the question, I'm surprised how many people still marry in contemporary Australia, especially in comparison to New Zealand, where it is less popular. Is there a correlation between common law rights and bigamy, or is it related to levels of uh, religious reasons? I don't know how to summarise that question. Did everybody hear it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, and then your audience would have. So I'm not uh, aware of how many people are marrying in Australia now. I didn't think that the rates were that high. I may be wrong. Uh, I, I, I always thought that modern society do not marry uh, that much. So I, I, I would be interested in knowing, I'm a historian, I really look in the past. Uh, but uh, in terms of, if I uh, remember what was said, in terms of religion, that's something I want to look into my research. I'm looking into uh, the first marriage and second marriage, if they get married religiously, uh, to see the impact of religion. Uh, I haven't yet, because this takes much longer, I have to go and uh, I don't have all the data yet to compile about first and second marriage, and there'll be a lot of it going into ancestry, getting that. But so far, what I can say about religion is that there's less Catholic who are bigots. Actually, there was a really good case. Can I talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> Richard, in 1936, I believe, said uh, he's, a, he's caught as a bigamist, and he said, um, actually, the first marriage was not Catholic, so I'm not a bigamist uh, because it doesn't count. Because in the Catholic Church, you know, you have to be married like, as a Catholic for it to count. And actually, he gets a suspended sentence. But don't come and think it's because you believe the Catholics were not, and you know, like you gave them leeway. Actually, the reason he did get a suspended sentence is because the priest, uh, not the priest, but the minister who married first died. There was uh, his first wife was illiterate. I don't know why that's a reason, but that's what the judge said. And the third reason is that uh, the witnesses have vanished. So my preacher, Catholic guy. Uh, can marry first time as a Catholic. Uh, but uh, so religion was a question here. Uh, I'm doing an informal survey about why people marry these days. And uh, young people who married lately was for the big party. Well, on that uh, happy note, <laughs> <laughs> you can cut it then. <laughs> I think that uh, it's probably time for us to wrap up. So thank you so very much, Melanie, uh, for coming to speak to us this evening. It's been fascinating, and I'm pretty sure that we could all sit here and listen to these uh, brilliant and wonderful findings that you've found. Findings that you've found. Oh, dear. It's definitely dinner time for me. Uh, <laughs> Um, all evening. So um, do feel free to come and ask uh, some questions. Uh, don't keep Melanie for too long. Um, I'm sure she's got dinner to go and get to as well, but she has invited you to share a few stories with her. So do come and grab her if you would like to do that. Um, but thank you everybody for coming and joining us this evening. Thank you everybody on Zoom for joining us and thank you for joining us here uh, in Hobart and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your week uh, and the rest of your time in Australia. Thank you. Thank you.